So I think uh, I am again online. I want to wish all of you a very happy Saturday ha and welcome to another uh, microscopy live stream on Micro Pantry all over here. I'm just getting some of the technical stuff uh, sorted out here. Yes, I can see myself also um, yeah, in YouTube. So I think everything seems to be working. Sound is good. Thank you very much for joining in again. <laughs> and uh, um, glad that many of you um, showed up again here. I just uh, also hear that the sound seems to be working um, for you, I hope. Okay, um, yeah, here we are again uh, to another um, Saturday live stream. Today I would like to put a little bit of food under the microscope. As a matter of fact, I would like to put some processed food under the microscope. Uh, and uh, as uh, you might already know, those live streams are a little bit improvised, uh, and uh, so we're going to see how the whole li where the whole live stream is live stream is going to take us. Um, and uh, yes, uh, if you're new to this live stream, I have every Saturday um, in the evening. Well, evening that's Central Europe in Central Europe where I am. That's the evening. It might be quite different from where you were living. Um, every Saturday, most uh, most of the times on Saturday, occasionally on Sunday, I have my live stream and where I'd like to share a little bit. Um, yeah, my hobby with you. And uh, today I would like uh, to put a few things under the microscope again. And uh, what you can see here is um, I've uh, prepared, made some, um, yeah, uh, some slides um, so that we save a little bit of time um, and I hope that uh, the live stream is going to be interesting again for you. If you have any questions, please uh, do feel free to post them in the comments uh, section. And uh, um, yeah, if you would like to uh, communicate among each other, that's of course fine. But if you have uh, something which is specifically directed to me, please indicate an at micropunter or at Oliver so that it's easy for me to find. Okay, uh, again, hello around, around the world. Uh, sound seems to be good. Good. And hello from Belgium, from Rhode Island, USA, from Germany, of course, uh, even from Austria, Vienna, from the UK, from Lebanon. Great. So what before I start, what I would like to do is I would like to do a little bit of, uh, I would like to show you a couple of pictures that one of my um, viewers has sent me. And I see, I see that he has actually also joined in in the chat here. Uh, Michael Kremer um, has sent me a couple of pictures. Thank you very much. And I would like to share them with you. And maybe Michael, maybe you can also uh, write a few comments uh, in the chat if uh, people have any questions. Um, last week I talked about... Uh, yeah, Reinberg illumination. And look what uh, pictures uh, I was sent here. That is, uh, yeah, the yeah a sliding filter combination that Michael has made, um, and uh, he has basically used, uh, as far as I understand correctly, a laser cutter to cut out uh, those um, yeah those filters. I would like to explain this. I hope that I'm getting it right. What you see over here is is this here is of course uh, the the condenser, and what you have here is, is you have a slider. So what you're able to do here with this filter is, is you're able to combine uh, the color on the outside with the uh, different colors on on the inside. And uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, first of, of course uh, thank you very much for having sent me those pictures and of course he has also given me the permission to share um, those pictures with, with you um, yeah so and you see that over here um, this is uh, basically the filters for 10 times and 20 times uh, um, yeah objective okay and uh, I'll go on to the next one the several pictures here this is the bottom side here yeah so you can actually see here um, this is a swing out uh, optical element here and you can see over here this is the slider uh, where you're able to change uh, the color of the central um, yeah the central disc here so you're able to loosely combine uh, the different uh, colors I think it's uh, really nice uh, um, really 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 nice uh, and a pretty good idea. It seems to be made of cardboard, uh, but cut out with uh, with a uh, with a laser cutter. Okay. Then there's another picture over here. Here, that's basically both sliders. The top one is is for ten times and twenty times uh, objective. The bottom one for forty and sixty times. And, and what you can already see here is is that the size of the central disc is has to be larger um, at uh, uh, a higher magnification, or rather, more correctly, for those um, objectives that have a higher numerical aperture. These are usually the obviously the higher magnifying ones. You need a larger central disc. Yeah. So you see over here the disc diameter here is 12 millimeters and over here 16 millimeters. Yeah. So it's quite nice. Uh, move on here again. Here that is. These are the different parts uh, that are. Um, yeah. Basically. Um, yeah. The yeah. Taken apart. So you see over here this is the slider with the central discs here. Right. That is uh, the holder. And these are 
Now the discs, the outside discs. So you can essentially make any, any color combination that you would like to have. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, very, very nice. Uh, but now the last picture, I think, is really the, 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 the important one here because it actually shows you a, uh, yeah, what color combinations you're able to get. So these are all diatoms we have here. And those diatoms, uh, you can see that uh, those diatoms essentially yeah, um, have different color combinations here. Yeah, so the background and, and the foreground color. Yeah. So let me quickly see if I'm able to... Yeah, here, here's the arrow right now. Yeah, of course, here, for example, you see that this is uh, yellow um, on blue. Um, down here, for example, blue on green, yeah, blue on red, you get the idea. Yeah? So this is really nice. Yeah? Um, so, um, so this is actually a, a very uh, yeah, a good idea. I remember many years ago what I tried to do, and it also worked, is um, I tried to make um, a slider like this for oblique illumination and I um, I have to I'll be honest I don't remember where I put it <laughs> so I have to find it again but um, it was actually like this that um, I used the slider here um, I included simply a diagonal black uh, like a long diagonal black triangle and by sliding it I was able to cover more and more of the central part and this allowed me also to get a very precisely adjusted oblique illumination the reason why I had that is because it did not have a swing out filter holder yeah. So I actually have uh, also experimented with those slider systems before, and I think this is uh, uh, quite, a, a, uh, quite a nice thing here. Okay, so um, I'm going to answer a few questions um, in the in the comment section if they're directed to me, and then I would like to do a little bit of microscopy here. So Crispy uh, B is asking, I would like to send you a few photos taken with my macro and micro lens up to 20 times, and I want to ask you what kind of optical magnification you would accept as a minimum. Oh, honestly, um, if you would like to send me pictures uh, to be presented here, um, it doesn't really matter. Um, you please uh, just send me the best, best pictures that you want me uh, to share here. And then uh, in an upcoming live stream, I'm um, quite uh, willing uh, to share them. My general recommendation is, is, is that uh, um, you try to make the main object as large as possible. So make sure that it, um, sometimes uh, if there's a lot of background and the main the object, the specimen is very small, then I have to zoom in quite a bit um, and then you lose resolution um, just make sure whatever magnification you use is, is try to send me a picture that um, yeah, where the main specimen is relatively large because then I do not lose uh, much image quality when I have to zoom in Okay, so that is a really, uh, yeah, uh, really nice, uh, really nice thing here and what I would like to do now is, is I would like to now um, actually go to today's topic um, and I would like to, yeah, um, I would like to um, show you um, a few things that I put under the microscope, okay? And um, as a matter of fact, I would like to talk a little bit um, about the background information of why, how I actually came about uh, um, those specimens here. A couple of days ago, um, um, yeah, I went to a cafeteria, local university cafeteria, which is next uh, to the school where I teach. I occasionally walk over and have a, a little bit of lunch there. And I saw that they sold something, yeah, I'll say it now in, now in German, for those of you who speak German, uh, veganes Krautfleisch, vegan cabbage meat, vegan meat with cabbage. And I have to tell you, to my knowledge, I've never eaten vegan meat before. And to me, this kind of sounds a little bit, sounded a little bit like a contradiction. How is this possible to have vegan meat? This doesn't work. Um, as a matter of fact, it's uh, artificial meat made of uh, soybeans. And I ordered that dish and it was pretty good, right? And uh, of course, you know, um, what I did then is, is I took along a piece uh, of the meat uh, um, in a little tube. I always carry those tubes around um, yeah, with me in case I find some interesting samples. And uh, that, that's basically the meat here, right? Um, this is this vegan meat. And um, I quickly rinsed it in water. And right now, uh, this is not water, this is uh, pure alcohol. Um, because I want to um, store it for a longer time and uh, therefore I rinsed it first in water to remove the tomato sauce <laughs> and so on um, and then I added uh, yeah, pure alcohol um, and uh, left it in there for a day and then I um, removed the alcohol again and added some fresh alcohol so that it's now almost completely free of water 
And I put it under the microscope and uh, I would like to share that with you, but not only that. Um, I said, that's kind of interesting because I found some interesting things in there. I decided, well, actually, I'd like to um, yeah, put some more of this vegan meat under the microscope. So I actually went out today in the morning to the supermarket. And this was, this was pretty expensive stuff, right? Um, and I actually bought several different types of, of, of vegan meat. And um, I all put them into alcohol simply so that they do not become spoiled. And I also actually made one uh, at home using wheat. Uh, it's, uh, um, it's basically, um, yeah, it's possible to remove the starch. And then what you have left is, is basically only the wheat protein. It didn't taste very good. And I said, I'm going to put this under the microscope. And I would like to compare this a little bit with, uh, with, uh, with real meat. And uh, I also prepared a quick, uh, I think over here is a short video that I have. Okay, yeah, so that is basically the, the three types of vegan meat that uh, basically I bought today in the morning. And uh, yeah, uh, shredded meat and, and, and yeah, I don't know, it looks a little like, like chicken. Um, and uh, yeah, we've eaten now most of it. And uh, but for me, of course, I have uh, microscopy as a, as a main interest here. So I put this uh, basically under, yeah, um, under the microscope. But not only that, I've also got some um, some uh, some coffee over here, some salsa sauce, uh, some real meat as well. Um, yeah, because I would like to share um, a couple of things with you. Because honestly, I don't know. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I am not always very convinced of this stuff here. Okay. So what I'm gonna do first is, is I'm going to show you now. Um, this uh, is basically what I've uh, yeah, found uh, under the microscope, and uh, yeah, you see that uh, this is vegan meat, the one from the that I had in the cafeteria, and. When I looked at it for the first time, um, I, I was always finding those strange little structures here. Yeah, I was kind of wondering what is this, and I have a suspicion. I have a suspicion. But you see all of those things here, it's pretty shredded. I was not able to find any or, or almost no intact cells. Okay? Yeah, I was almost not able to find any intact cells. Um, occasionally I was able to find those round circles. These seem to be fat droplets. Okay, so that's basically my lunch from a couple of days ago uh, from university, right? Um, of course, no bacteria because I immediately added alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of... And here again, this is what a weird thing here. Look at this. Okay. Uh, well, it's, what's kind of a, a strange thing? Seems to be somehow cut off. And uh, yeah, I'm a little bit, the thing that kind of disturbed me a little bit is that I was not able to see any cells because I thought this is some kind of a soy product. As a matter of fact, I think it is. But it's so extremely shredded yeah, that I was not able to see any intact cells. Uh, actually, in one case, I found a xylem, which are the, the tissues that are actually able to transport water. Okay. And then there's, well, where is this other thing? There was this one thing that I was kind of... Uh, looking for. Yeah, these things here, I found a lot of those. Some of them seem to be um, textile fibers, yeah, a lot of them. But this one over here um, also kind of had a very interesting appearance. Yeah, and here I think somewhere over on the top here. Yeah, look at this thing. What's this long thing here? I said, okay, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Okay. Um, and I'm going to show you some real meat in contrast. <laughs> somebody is, is somebody saying not very uh, ap appetizing, and I agree with you. Not very app. Come on, this is, what is this? And when I looked at this, this is, this is kind of interesting. Uh, where have I seen this before? Uh, and this doesn't this, this 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 doesn't look like a um, some kind of a, a fiber because often you find fibers, and I found also a lot of fibers in in in, in this here. Yeah. And uh, was kind of, uh, and and the thing that kind of disturbed me a, a bit, a little bit, is is normally if you see some kind of textile fibers, then usually those textile fibers, like uh, microplastics and so on, very common. Usually it's kind of cut off, but this tapers off and becomes very thin, and so it, it looks more like an algae. Oh, you're very optimistic. It's this is not that's not an algae. How many of you think uh, know what this is? Yeah, yeah, this, this looks like a nematode worm. And one of the things why I think that this could be one is, is because if you look in the center, then you're actually able to see that there seems to be like a little tube running. This could be the digestive system. Now, it's nothing unusual to find nematode worms. They are very, very ubiquitous um, because they live uh, one of the most common animal <laughs> yeah, 
uh, the types here. Um, yeah, but over here, um, um, somewhere over here, I think I found uh, fibers. Basically, these are not worms, right? These things here, these are uh, basically um, fibers, uh, dust fibers, um, sometimes also microplastics. Because if this is actually a soy product, then um, essentially you shouldn't be surprised because they found those microplastics also, of course, in, in, in rain. Huh? And this one over here, um, this here is most likely not uh, a worm. Because if you actually look at this, then you're actually able to see how um, how the fibers uh, are kind of split apart here. Yeah. And so it uh, so fibers look uh, very um, and they also do not taper off so much. Yeah. So let, let me go down a little bit with the magnification here. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, and now back uh, now back to back to this. Um, I wonder if I'm able to find it again here. Back to this guy over here, and remember. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's uh, most likely a worm, and uh, I found a lot of these uh, things that I showed you before. I hope I'm able to find it again. Yeah, the one that I showed you at the beginning. I think that these are also shredded worms. Honestly, I think these are actually um, during the the processing, um, yeah, um, of this, uh, yeah, of this uh, food. Um, it could indeed be that. Uh, yeah, let me see if maybe maybe somewhere over there. This was. Uh, Remember the thing that I showed you at the beginning? I can't find it anymore. Yeah, but there were many of those. I, this looked a little bit like uh, like shredded. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, this one over here. Yeah, Th that's the thing that I wanted to show you, and uh, the one over here. This one over here. Yeah. Let's go in a little bit. Yeah, it, that's a hypothesis from my side. Yeah. Um, could could also be that uh, because it does look a little bit torn off, it could be like this is kind of the intestine on the inside, yeah? this kind of shredded. Yeah, so this is kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, so you're saying if it has nematodes, it's technically not vegan. Vegan, uh, you, technically, yeah, um, you're you're right. But honest, on the other hand, you cannot really avoid uh, avoid them. I just want to show you something else now because the next thing that I would like to show you is some uh, salsa sauce that uh, I also put under the microscope and I would like to explain this here because this salsa sauce, um, let me go very quickly to the bottom part here. I remember, so that's the, uh, it's an air bubble here. Nothing to worry about here. Um, where is this? Let me go down a little bit with the magnification again because um, over here, let me see if I'm able to find this. Uh, ah, yeah, here. Um, so let's uh, go up here. That's a size of sauce and look what I found here. What do you think this is? <laughs> yeah, it also looks like a little nematode worm, but uh, um, yeah, uh, they are quite common. So this is a little bit the thing that surprised me uh, how often do you, but what you see here is, is that these round things that you see here, these are indeed cells. So that you see that uh, the size of sauce containing tomato and I don't know what vegetables um, essentially is not that highly processed and you're still able to see um, more or less intact cells. Yeah. So, and I think there was, uh, if we go across here, somewhere over here, I don't know, I found, Let's go a little bit up like this. I darkly remember, I, I think somewhere over here I found, if I remember correctly, somewhere over here or not. Let me see. There was another one somewhere over here, which I cannot find anymore. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. But in any case, if you if you look at uh, um, at uh, at food like this, then of course you shouldn't be surprised that you're also able to find all sorts of other things like I mean, um, yeah, mites and, and so on. Uh, not a surprise because um, of course uh, um, the, this is a biological origin here. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Could this be one? Yeah, here it is. Yeah. yeah. So let's go up here a little bit more with the magnification. Open it up. Yeah. Again, here you might uh, be able to see that uh, yeah. there seems to be a whole tube in there because um, generally uh, fibers and so on they do not look quite as as, as uh, yeah um, um, as regular. Sometimes a little bit more twisted and so on. Yeah. yeah so it's uh, basically this um, again. This is uh, just for yeah. This is uh, some uh, size. Uh huh. 
my disk space ran out, but I hope that uh, this uh, you're still able to see me. Yeah, so this is basically um, here, um, very common. Uh, you're able to see here uh, the individual cells. You can see that it's pigmented in here, right? Um, usually, um, if you put uh, some tomato sauce or so um, under the microscope, then um, you're also able to see those uh, pigmented parts. Yeah. So this is um, actually uh, something that, um, yeah, um, to, just to compare a little bit uh, the, the processed uh, food a little bit. I would like to now put a few other, um, um, yeah, vegan types of meat under the microscope. So let me quickly remove those here. Okay. I just wanted to also take, uh, take one out here. Uh, where is the desk? And uh, yeah, I just numbered them. Yeah, and uh, the thing that I consider very fascinating here with these is okay. So first of all, this is in alcohol now, and the consistency kind of changes when you uh, remove water and when you put it into alcohol because it com becomes fairly hard. And basically, it's generally what happens with a lot of many tissue types. Yeah, so it's it's actually a very yeah hard, but it does seem to pull a little bit fibers almost like meat fibers but then again this is not uh, this is not um yeah meat but uh, mostly plant protein um quite fascinating that it still has a chicken like texture um and if you want to put it under the microscope what you have to do is you have to add it you have to rehydrate it with water so you just drop it for a few minutes into water then the alcohol is going to be removed and water is going to go in it's going to become very soft and then you can easily um you can easily put it on the microscope slide yeah, so this is basically what I've done here, and I just wanted to tell you that the, just for reference purposes, um, the other four uh, types of uh, vegan meat look very similar under the microscope. Okay, so I've uh, basically prepared this already. So let's have a look here, and uh, let's put it under the microscope again. And uh, so this is basically. Another type of, and let's close the condenser, go down a little bit with the, yeah. And uh, this is how it looks like here, yeah. Um, I think it must be quite a bit of coagulated, uh, uh, yeah, plant protein, yeah. yeah. But again, it's pretty shredded, the whole thing, yeah, no intact cells. And I'm going to show you some real meat for comparison just in a, just a minute or so. So this kind of, uh, I think it, it's, um, I know it doesn't look very, um, very interesting. Not as, not quite as interesting as, as, um, as maybe water life and, 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 and we have got little critters moving around. I, I get all of that, but still, uh, by looking under the microscope, I mean, I still consider it kind of interesting. Um, this is maybe, uh, yeah, to see that essentially I'm not able to recognize any structures. As a matter of fact, uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday when I did a first trial here, I was able to see, I was so happy, I was able to see actually a little bit of some xylem. Yeah? Look look again, do you see this again here, what I mean? Again this here, they, they keep on reappearing over and over again. Yeah, And I wonder if these are, it's a different sample by the way. It's a different sample. And yeah. Yeah, again, over here, something yeah, little elongated ones, like almost something is, is cut off. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, quite um, quite interesting. Again, um, the thing, the, this, uh, this vegan meat is actually, I, I think, um, it, it seems to be, um, from the little research that I've done, uh, highly processed food, right? Um, yeah, it's... Uh, uh, it's highly processed, so I'm, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to show you also the other one. Yeah, so, so again, these are different uh, brands and different uh, types of, 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 of vegan meat. So this one over here contains um, those tiny, look at this, those tiny bubbles. Uh, these are fat droplets, I'm almost sure. So you see that this one seems to contain more fat, yeah? than the previous ones, because we're able to see those uh, tiny fat droplets. Yeah. Yeah. So, quite, uh, quite, uh, still quite interesting yeah? um, to, but uh, again, it's, it's difficult to make a little bit sense of the things that you see here. Yeah? And again, one of those weird over here. 
Again, this is a different, again, a different uh, brand of, of vegan meat. Oh, look at this. Again, one of those strings here. Um, I found quite a few of those. This, I don't know if this is, this looks uh, a little bit too irregular for, for maybe even, yeah. So that's very dense here. Here we, see, we seem to be, um, yeah, that's the edge, there's some uh, water bubble. Not water bubble, ear bubble, of course. Yeah. And a lot of uh, oil droplets. Yeah. So, and uh, just one of three and four. Three and four, again, two different types of, uh, of brands. As a matter of fact, number four is a homemade, homemade vegan meat that I tried to make using flour. This is too bright. I have to go down here again with the brightness a little bit. Yeah. Uh, totally shredded. And uh, yeah, these here, for example, th this here look, doesn't look so much like this. looks looks like more like a fiber. Yeah. Not related to microscopy at all, but in your opinion, do you think lab meat is healthy or not? Since it's a very processed, like you said. <laughs> uh, I, I will tell you, I will tell you the, the um, my, my students, uh, also asked me that, uh, what do you think is healthy food and so on. And indeed, I did find a, um, an interesting um, response by a, um, he passed away and uh, many years ago, he was a cook, a television cook. Um, and uh, they interviewed him about this, about healthy food and what is his advice. And he said something quite interesting. And I also tell that to my students because many people want to eat healthy food and what's healthy right now. And he gave the following advice. He said is, is, um, in his lifetime, he's seen so many different opinions about what's healthy and what's not healthy. And, and some people say you're supposed to eat less meat. I generally also agree we should eat less meat. Um, as a society, often we eat too much. Uh, but then again, if, yeah, if, if you switch over to, to other food types, then there could be, um, again, poisonous substances in there and you should not eat French fries because of the acrylamides that are in there. And you should not eat um, pork uh, because of, I don't know, some hormones which are in there. And he said something quite interesting. He said the following is, is the best thing probably is um, eat to eat a varied, diverse uh, type of food. Yeah. So if uh, you eat lab meat occasionally, yeah, it's not going to make you ill. Yeah, <laughs> of course not. Why should it? Yeah? Um, uh, if you eat too much of anything, uh, yeah, um, it, it's going to make you ill. It's, it's, it's probably not healthy, right? So I, I would say it is not really what it is so much, but but how much you you eat of the things. Yeah. But in any case, um, yeah, um, the reason um, why I put this under the microscope is simply because I wanted to. To see how this, um, how does uh, this, uh, yeah, highly processed meat actually look looks like? Generally, um, one should um, not eat too many processed food types. This is as a general rule. But occasionally, if you eat one occasionally, I think it's not a big, of course, not a big issue. So I'm going to now show you something else, and. Uh, yeah, it is, um, where is the desk view? So I'm going to show you some, some time ago, some months ago, I did make a video of this. Um, this is <laughs> real meat, um, which I got, it's dried meat. It's uh, uh, elk or moose meat. It's jerky, as they call it. It's uh, salted and dried. And uh, yeah, it was uh, given to me as a present. It's from Norway. So it's, it was a, a kind of a souvenir present, uh, yeah, um, Norwegian elk jerky. And what I done is, is I took a little bit of a bit of this meat and uh, rehydrated it with water. So I added that it's basically a little bit, yeah, in here. And then I put it again under the microscope. So this is now real meat. And I'm going to now show you how real meat looks like under the microscope. It doesn't really matter if you use uh, elk meat or beef or, or pork or even chicken. It doesn't matter because the general structure of skeletal muscle is uh, is quite similar, and uh, I did make a few videos already in the past. And uh, when we when I talk about muscle and movement uh, in biology class, then I also usually show them the videos. Uh, but I need to go down a little bit with the magnification to give you a better overview here. Okay, let me remove this here. Yeah, and what you're able to see here. Uh, maybe I don't, I don't know if this is a better place here. Is this everything? No. 
So th this dark line, that's an ear, ear bubble. Okay, yeah, but what ear you are able to see here is, is of course, that real meat uh, is made of uh, individual fibers, muscle fibers, and you see them here running in parallel. And th these are uh, the muscle cells. Yeah? So this uh, basically means that, uh, yeah, these are, the cells are still intact, obviously. Yeah? And when you zoom in, then you're able to see and now this is where it becomes a little bit tricky because I have to find now a good place um, to find that. So usually where it's very thin and I have to go up with the magnification as well. We, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to try it here maybe. Yeah. I'm going to go up with the magnification. No. Not good. Too, too thick here. No. Uh, also not such a good uh, place and it's actually quite difficult to observe in any case and uh, well, maybe over here I don't know it might be easier to see directly under the microscope let's go up yet further hmm uh, there it's uh, the specimen is, is quite thick See, it's very thick, very dark. Let's have a look here. Uh, you see, it seems to be touching the, the objective seems to be touching the, the cover glass already. So when I focus, it's kind of pushing down on the cover glass. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit unfortunate that I'm not able. I wanted to actually show you the so-called the striations of the muscle. But that's kind of very difficult to see here. Um, in one of my previous videos that I made, um, it's actually much better visible. And let's go up here now with the magnification. Uh, it's very sad that I'm not able. Well, in any case, I'll, um, this is a more preparation problem that, that I've uh, made here. But um, if you look very carefully, then you might actually see that there are these, uh, um, yeah, the fibers, the muscle fibers run parallel like this, but then there are these... Uh, uh, cross striations. These are the so-called light and the dark bands. Very difficult to see actually. So if you you have to have a pretty good microscope uh, to be able to see those, right? And uh, th that's why it's referred to striated muscle. But I think the the real reason why I wanted to show this to you is is that uh, yeah, this um, in this case the the cells are all quite still intact. Okay, and it's not quite shredded. <laughs> Maybe ah, I forgot the condenser. Dang, of course. Okay. That, that's why I didn't I forgot to. So maybe, maybe we're able to see this better. It's still too thick a little bit. I should have remembered a, a good place. No. Otherwise, I'm just going to move on. Um, yeah. yeah. A little bit, maybe. Ah, here, here we go. Okay. That that's here. It's very thin. Now you you should be able to see those very fine, uh, yeah, lines that uh, run perpendicular to the muscle fibers, and these are the light and the dark bands, and that's actually an indicator that you're actually dealing with skeletal muscle. Yeah. So that that's a little bit the thing I just wanted to 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 show you here as well. I'm just gonna read some of the the comments here. Okay. Uh, so no comments from me. Yep. Mm -hmm. The, some some discussion going on about uh, processed food. Well, of course, also this meat is processed in the sense that uh, it's uh, been dried, um, of course, and also um, yeah, salted and 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 so on. Yeah. So um, let's let's go back here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a, a comment here. Uh, in everyday life, I think processed means more like adding chemicals and changing the color and foods to make them look nice. Yeah, that could also be. Yeah. Um, so processing can mean quite a few different things. Yeah? So let's move on um, a little bit here. What time is it? So, and uh, three, four. So, um, yeah, I think the salsa sauce we already looked at. And uh, let's have, um, and this here is some, where is the thing that I wanted to show you? Mm. Ah, here it is. Look, um, I've got here, uh, this is uh, yeah mango apple mousse. It's actually sold in those packets, yeah, and uh, yeah, 
lots of packaging material and then you can unscrew the cap and then you can suck out the, the mousse. Um, yeah, environmentally because of the trash, not very, <laughs> not very friendly. Um, but I also want to show this to you under the microscope because here too we are able um, to see uh, that um, yeah, it seems to be just boiled, uh, boiled and 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 cooked because when you look under the microscope, we should still be able to see the individual cells. So this looks a little bit similar. This does look a little bit similar to the, um, yeah, to the, uh, uh, yeah, the salsa sauce from before. And look what we've got here. I was actually quite happy. Maybe the better samples. Um, but over here, I also found those long things that have those stripes in here. And that is most likely xylem. Xylem, these are cells that transport water. After all, uh, when we talk about apples and mango, these are plants. Right, and uh, when you go, yeah, and uh, another one here. <laughs> you, we already know this little friend, right? Um, so I was also able to find a couple of worms. Uh, yeah, um, a couple of worms here, here as well. Yeah, and somewhere over there, there seems to be another one. Now that's not not one that's too irregular. Yeah, but occasionally, uh, yeah, you are able to find uh, a couple of these uh, nematode worms also um, also in here. Yeah. Um, let's uh, zoom in a little bit more because I would like to show you again how uh, yeah, uh, the cellular structure looks like and here quite nicely visible. Now you can see again here this is a cell. So for example, a couple of years, some time ago I made some pumpkin soup. We boiled some pumpkins and then uh, uh, yeah, I kind of mashed it, uh, mashed it up. Um, then um, you're still able, it rips apart the cells. Well, it separates the cells, but very often the cells themselves still stay intact. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so there, this is uh, actually uh, quite a nice uh, example of uh, so-called maceration, as it's, co as it's called. This is indeed also a, a preparation technique for microscopy. When some specimens are uh, too solid and too thick, then by boiling it and heating it, uh, sometimes you're also able to soften the tissue and then uh, you're able to separate the individual cells. I think the reason could be is because many cells are held together by a polysaccharide called pectin. And, uh, yeah, um, and uh, so this one here looks more like a, either plant fiber or something, not so much like a worm. And the pectin, um, when you heat it up, uh, then um, yeah, it becomes soft and this might actually cause the cells to separate. So let's have a closer look at this one here. Okay. Let's open this a little bit because this here, uh, again, is something that I was able to find several times here. Um, if you look very carefully here, you also are able to see that there seems to be some kind of like a, like a spiral or coil. That is uh, definitely xylem tissue. So water is being transported um, in, um, in those cells. These are long tube-like tube cells that also give the plants their strength. Um, also in bananas you find this, yeah. And sometimes also on Reddit, and, and sometimes people post pictures and say, well, "What is this weird spiral thing?" And and that's actually um, a sign that you're dealing with plants, yeah, because uh, these are um, those tubes where water is transported. Yeah? So and if you go just go through here, ah, yeah, and that's the other worm here, yeah. So that is um, yeah, this is <laughs> yeah, the second second worm. I think it's it's a worm, and I'm quite quite uh, quite sure it is one because uh, yeah of um, yeah it's because it's, uh, it's so tapered off. Usually, if you have some kind of uh, fibers or so, then it's rip, ripped off, and and then it's kind of a blunt end. But uh, this is most likely a dead nem nem yeah? <laughs> nematode worm. Yeah? Uh, again, you cannot avoid those those guys. They're yeah. Um, I read somewhere that um, every person eats around half a kilo kilogram, which is around a pound of insects every year, um, in the food that we eat. Simply because uh, in bread and and and, and wheat and, and and so on, because uh, yeah, they are simply yeah, too many of these animals in there. Huh? It's nothing to. I know this uh, might sound a little bit shocking uh, to some people, um, uh, but actually it's perfectly normal. I mean, our body. I mean, I mean there are more more an probably more animals <laughs> growing on our skin and in our body than we probably are even aware of. Um, just recently, I made again a video about so-called the face mites, which are pulled out of my eyelashes. Yeah, these are just no completely normal, um, yeah, uh, inhabitants of our body. 
As a matter of fact, uh, we have uh, more bacteria grow on our body and in our body than we have body cells, way more. So actually, we're mostly not even made of the cells that make us. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, quite, uh, yeah, quite, uh, quite nice. <laughs> yeah. So it, I know it's it's mostly psychology, but um, yeah, but uh, one should not forget that uh, at least we, um, I mean, I, now I'm talking for the Western society here, um, are in a minority concerning our uh, our consumption of food in the sense that the major. I read this somewhere. I mean, you can double check, um, but apparently the majority of uh, of people worldwide um, eat uh, insects as a main uh, protein source. And uh, yeah. So it's it's mostly a psychological issue. Again, those little um, yeah tube-like structures with uh, which seem to be a little bit spirally, which appears to be xylem. Yeah. So this is a little bit uh, yeah some of the stuff here. Uh, so maybe one of the ways of of analyzing of whether how processed the food is is to check <laughs> if, if if you're still able to see some cells here. That's a gigantic cell here. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah, well, we eat shrimp, that's correct. Well, shrimp uh, um, technically are not insects, but they are related to insects in the sense that they are arthropods. Yeah, arthropods are, are yeah, um, yeah. yeah, insects, spiders, shrimp, which belong to the crabs. So it's, it's not that far-fetched, the idea. Yeah. So... So, um, as a matter of fact, it's uh, been uh, even proposed, and that uh, again, it's mostly psychology for people who are not used to it. Um, it's proposed that uh, one should eat uh, if we need animal proteins. Eating eating insects actually is better for the environment compared to, for example, beef or pork. The reason being that uh, there is simply less energy needed. Yeah? So, for concerning the carbon footprint and so on, yeah? um, it's actually yeah better to to eat uh, um, yeah insects um, as a source of animal protein if you want to eat animal protein i mean not everyone um, not not everyone eats uh, meat yeah so ah yeah here i think oh we, that was the one that we had before that's again the xylem here right um one thing that i i also realized a little bit um a little bit too late um in, uh, in preparation of this live stream is this, uh, but you have to be careful uh, when doing that. Is uh, you can add a little bit of iodine solution. The iodine solution will uh, stain starch. So especially if you're using uh, plant material, you should be able to see the individual starch grains uh, turn black to purple. But you have to be a little bit careful because uh, the um, the iodine, especially if it is very concentrated, if it contacts the objectives, not a good thing because it's very corrosive. Yeah, so this is something that uh, you have to be a little bit careful when, when dealing with uh, with iodine. It, it it's um, yeah, very corrosive and damages uh, um, the microscope objectives if uh, it accidentally comes in contact with those. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I've eaten um, yeah we eat shrimp yes. Uh, so there is something with the xylem vessels. I've eaten uh, locust grasshoppers, so have I, in some restaurants in Austria. Oh, in Austria even? Okay, cool. Huh? Um, I've uh, a couple of years, over 10 years ago, I visited Mexico um, for a holiday, a uh, guided tour, and uh, I d deliberately ordered some um, yeah, grasshoppers there and uh, with some tortilla bread. And I have to admit, I was a little bit disappointed because it didn't look like grasshoppers. It just looked like regular shredded meat. Yeah, and that you could put on into your tortilla and then you eat it. Um, yeah, I s expected something spectacular, right? <laughs> a little bit uh, naively, I would say. But actually, it was prepared in a, a totally normal. It was totally normal, really. It was just regular, um, spicy uh, and, and salted, um, you know, grasshoppers. And if you looked at it, you could not identify any grasshoppers because they prepared it in such a way that you probably could cannot see it. Yeah, again, maybe also to overcome the psychology a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, Hadrian Meisen, uh, Geiger is uh, saying nematodes can be found in a wide variety of foods, whether it's dangerous if they are not, 
uh, whether it is dangerous if they're not cooked so I'm, I'm also thinking about the warm eggs that uh, get into your own digestive tract um Yes and no, I would say. Um, the thing is, is there are so many different type of nematode worms. It really depends on the species. And uh, what I heard again is, is that, for example, very common also in fish, uh, for example, raw fish, sushi. And for this reason, to kill off those nematode worms, what they, what they do is, is they have to freeze the sushi uh, fish, right? And this kills off the nematodes. So I would say it depends quite a bit on the type of, of, of worms uh, that there are there. And of course, there are certain pathogenic disease-causing nematodes that you definitely want to avoid, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, mine were pretty much intact with wings and legs. Technically, we're talking about the grasshoppers here. Technically, you should remove the wings and legs, uh, but they were nice and crunchy. Yeah, I also ate some, some ants, uh, some, some fried ants, which uh, tasted pretty good. I have to tell you, okay? So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll move on a little bit. What time is it? 45 minutes. I, I, I'm, I'm running uh, out, of, out of specimens to show you, um, honestly. Um, so I leave it up to you now to ask a lot of questions. So there are two more things I want to show you. This one here has been a request. And that is coffee. Yeah, so that's basically, I, I show you here. Um, I look, you might know this here, right? It's a coffee pad. Ah, it's, it's kind of, yeah. Uh, I just cut it open and took out, yeah. So um, that's basically one of those, those uh, uh, coffee pads and uh, um, coffee also being plant material. Um, should not be surprising if we all see those, yeah. Ground uh, coffee pieces and uh, yeah. Here too, um, I was uh, occasionally, if you look very carefully, occasionally you're also able to see um, yeah, still some intact cells maybe. Yeah, but again, it's the whole thing is shredded. It's ground up. It was roasted before. Yeah. And uh, again, those whatever would appear to be in this case, this appears to be some kind of fiber. Could also be maybe one of the um, the fibers uh, from from the paper of of the pad. Yeah, so yeah, one should not automatically assume that this is something yeah, that shouldn't be in there. Do you travel with your microscope on the bigger trips like Mexico? Well, I'd be, uh, during the Mexico time, I did not have, uh, was not so much into microscopy yet. Uh, how easy is it with scopes or samples with a plane? I recommend the following. Um, I do not travel with, a, I mean, I once did. I took along a small um, a small microscope, a children's, mi not, not a toy microscope, but one of those introductory microscopes. But um, I found it better to because the trips that I do are sometimes not that long um, so what I and you've got to be a little bit careful here okay what you're doing uh, because you do not want to transport any um, organisms uh, from uh, too far to remote place but if you're traveling locally what I usually do is, is uh, I take along those uh, yeah those tubes here and uh, if I want to collect a, a water sample, some algae or whatever, then you collect it and just make sure that you leave enough air in the tube. That's so important. And a couple of uh, years ago when I did a trip, I made uh, this is just such a stupid mistake. I should have known better. Uh, I've taken along several of those tubes and um, I took some water samples along and then I filled them up completely you know, with algae and everything and, f and put a cap on top. And after a few days, the whole thing started to smell bad because it went uh, anaerobic. Basically, it started to become foul and decompose, right? Um, you have to make sure that there is always sufficient air in here. And if there is, it can store for a surprisingly long time. Yeah, um, And maybe then you can open it every... yeah yeah every day and then you close it and then yeah you to get a little bit more some of the co2 and oxygen exchanged for the algae that are in there um, and then you're going to be fine you will leave it at a bright place so that the algae uh, do photosynthesis yeah and uh, then there's plenty of oxygen for any uh, microorganisms uh, that are in there or maybe some water crustaceans or so yeah um, generally i would say the following um Really, if you go traveling and if you take some water samples along, the, the things that you're going to find, they are not going to be 
if, if, if not so different. I mean, you always find, yeah, um, it, it's more like, um, um, how do you say, a, <laughs> a souvenir that you take along. Huh? Um, so, but generally, you'll have to be, um, as a general rule, if you travel to a very far place, um, you don't want to carry along uh, some water samples or, or plant material, uh, and, and, and then it's um, with possible diseases or whatever. So, you should not. So you should be careful and, and, and not make sure that it does not get in contact with the environment. Uh, this is, um, how do you say, you're just, I'm just saying this, but we all know that uh, because of modern transport and all of the ships, for example, that are um, taking up water in one place for for, for ba bala how do you call this for balance weight and balance and then they're dumping the water again so there is indeed a lot of, of transfer of organisms and animals and, and plants happening uh, because of, of traveling right uh, especially those big container ships apparently um, are, are an issue as well right because they are carrying large quantities of of um, yeah of, of living things um, in the in the water that you're um, you're loading and unloading yeah? so yeah but still one should be a little bit for traveling should be a little bit careful here yeah so what else do I have um, yeah uh, yeah I was thinking that were probably paper fibers yeah some of these things are definitely probably some paper fibers from uh, from from the coffee pad okay um, I think uh, traveling with a microscope um, hmm yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I tried it um, once, but then again, um, it, yeah. I want to take pictures. Then you see, then you have to have a, a proper photo adapter, or, or at least, yeah, and, and so on. So it, it, it's a little bit um, um, not not quite as easy as as I hoped it to be. Yeah? But I have done this as well already. Yeah, yeah. So so I'm quickly checking here. Um, some other comments here just a second give me a minute or so aha uh -huh. 64 people are watching that's quite a that's quite a, quite a number and yeah so I hope because sometimes uh, yeah I've got the lights so because sometimes the the chat comments are not displayed in the correct sequence so there's this thing called live chat and top chat so it could be uh, maybe top chat okay yeah, you should look at the displays from different smartphones in the future. Yep. Um, this is um, looking at displays of different smartphones is something that um, works with uh, a stereo microscope as well. Um, but you can also try that with, uh, um, yeah, with uh, um, the low power magnification of, uh, um, of a compound microscope. Now, I don't have my smartphone with me right now here. But um, all you, but that's actually um, something that I, um, yeah, recommend that you try. You just basically uh, place the smartphone. You turn off the light and you just put the display of the smartphone directly um, here, and uh, you are able to see the individual pixels. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it's uh, ah yeah. This is another thing I wanted to show you, and maybe the last thing. Yeah. Uh, thanks to your excellent videos, I was able to purchase my girlfriend a great microscope for birthday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I I did um, I did uh, I, I did talk to a representative of a company once and I asked him who in the world buys microscopes from your company. I mean, who are the people? Yeah, hobbyists or or who? And then he says, yeah, surprisingly, um, many people who have been working in a lab before. For example, technical assistance, laboratory assistance, and so on. Um, sometimes when they went into retirement, he said, this is uh, as a retirement present or birthday present, even they, they buy a microscope. Yeah. So what I would like to do now is, is I would like to show you something. Look what I got here. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's called raclette cheese. It's a very strong, smelly cheese. Okay. And uh, yeah, I want to show you here the edge here. Looks a little bit slimy. It's still edible. It's uh, still fine, but it smells very strong. <laughs> it's not, uh, yeah, it's quite ripe. Um, and um, what I would like to do now is I would like to take a little a small sample here from the edge because occasionally I get some questions from people and says, I want to, I don't know, spoil some food and I want to see some bacteria. And I say, eh, you don't want to spoil food. 
um, you might because you don't know what you're really growing but then on the other hand uh, what, what is cheese I mean there are bacteria and fungi growing on here um, the, the, the cheese has been inoculated with those and for this reason we're going to now look at some bacteria okay and uh, it actually quite works quite um, easily you know, put a little bit of uh, by the way, uh, this, uh, these pipettes um, are quite practical because it, you can also pick up, uh, how do you call it, very small animals. Like, uh, yeah, for example, face mites uh, I've already picked up or water bears. They can be collected using this pipette as well. And then what you do next is, is you take um, some kind of a, um, either toothpick. I don't have toothpicks now, so I'm just going to take my, my, yeah, my tweezers and uh, it's very soft, so you carefully... Scratch off some of the yeah, material here. Dip it in into the drop of water. And of course, you'll, you're going to get a lot of uh, cheese protein, milk protein here as well. But it's a cover glass. This is, this is probably too dense. This is probably way too dense. Yeah. So if it, if there's too much of this. Uh, sample on here then either you use a tissue paper or you just remove some of the excess liquid okay and let's have a look at this uh, probably too dense but it doesn't matter so this here is now some cheese under the microscope okay and uh, yeah what do we see here okay not uh, a lot yet Okay, some air bubbles, some, I don't know, some cheese, milk, protein, whatever. But the really interesting thing, you have to really go up with the magnification yet more. Okay, yet more, at least before, I was able to see quite a bit of this. Ah, not so much now. It's a little bit disappointing. Maybe I didn't get the right one. So this here is now phase contrast. Uh, this is what you call a demonstration effect. It's not so, I'm not so happy with that. Ah, the density is quite low. Okay, because what you see those, uh, this phase contrast, now those dark dots that you see, these are of course bacteria you know, that are growing on the cheese. Those, those, not, not the bright dots here, but those tiny ones in the background. You see that some of the dots are moving, that's because of Brownian motion. Okay, so I am not quite happy with this sample. So let's look at the one that I prepared before, which is the same one, which was a little bit more. Um, let me see. Uh, it's a little bit dried up here. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me see if I'm able to find a good place over here. See, this is already too dense. But, no, maybe over here, no, it's, uh, yeah, here we go, that's, uh, that's where the liquid part is, yeah, yeah, those dots that you see here in the background, yeah, um, many of them are actually uh, bacteria. This seems to be also a little bit dry already, this specimen. Let me try the other one over here again. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Hmm. I'm just looking for... Yep, here they are. Yeah. So those tiny little dots uh, between the white uh, uh, particles here. Yeah. Um, also demonstrates a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. Also here. Yeah. Uh, also demonstrates a little bit uh, the, the 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 purpose of, of why phase contrast is actually an advantage. Yeah. So. Yeah. So different types of fruit juices. Um, um, I'll also try to do that. I've tried this also before. Um, if you uh, depends a lot on the fruit juice. Uh, if you, for example, have uh, freshly pressed orange juice, then it looks, of course, very different than orange juice that was made from a concentrate, um, because freshly pressed orange juice still contains a lot of these cell fragments um, in there. So you're actually able to see quite a bit of of of, um, of the cells as well. Yeah.
Uh, is dark field microscopy even possible without a condenser? I'm think tinkering around 3D printing, and so as far as I understand, it would need a lens between the light source and the specimen, and generally, yes. Um, depends uh, which microscope you have. Generally, any most of the microscopes these days, except the introductory microscopes, most of the microscopes actually have a, a, a condenser. Now, if you um, do not have one, what you might try is, is to actually try to shine light on top of the specimen. Yeah? Um, so basically using a flashlight or maybe some kind of a, yeah, LED lamp or whatever, and then shine light on top of it, this might also um, yeah, work and increase the contrast. Yeah? But uh, generally, uh, if you have a, a children's microscopes or introductory microscopes without a condenser, then it's most likely it's not dark field is not going to work, unfortunately. But you still can try to experiment around with polarization because that should work. Because polarization microscopy does not depend on a condenser. Yeah. Okay, people. Um, yeah, um, I think I'm through with all of my specimens that I wanted to show you. Um, unless you have any specific requests. But you know what? Um, I do, do want to try something. Um, just for the fun of it. I'm going to pull out one of those. Um, yeah. The, what do you call this, this um, artificial meat again? I would like to add some methylene blue for staining. Okay. Um, and uh, oh, that's now again phase contrast. No, I just want to look at this here. And uh, I'm going to leave it at, at bright field. And it needs to. Okay. So this is not bright field. And let's try a little bit of staining and let's see how this actually, um, yeah, how this actually works. And uh, I will use a, you have to be, as always, you have to be careful. I'm going to add some stain now directly um, on the slide, which uh, is uh, on the microscope. So you do not want to get any stain, of course, uh, you know, on the objective. Look, I'll just show you what I'm doing here. Just transferring some of the, I'm sucking some of, some of the methylene blue here into the pipette because I have a little bit more control this way. And I'm going to add it now here, hoping that... See how it starts to flush? And let's move over a little bit here. And what we should be able to see is that usually organic materials and so on. Let me quickly check. Yeah usually stain darker relatively quickly. And this is kind of interesting here. Ah, here, here we go, for example, yeah. So you see that, yeah, you can actually see how those particles start to stain. Also a possibility to increase contrast. Yeah. Usually also over here, also quite common, is, is that uh, usually things start to stain on the outside first and then slowly the stain diffuses in, inwards and also starts to stain the center. Okay. So I have a cheap introductory microscope. Unfortunately, I thought about using a lens from a magnifying glass and DIY, um, and DIY condenser. Um, you see, the whole thing with the condenser is a little bit a delicate issue because it, uh, it has to do with the angle of the light. It really focuses the light very precisely. So I don't know if you're able to make your own condenser that easily right um, so but I just wanted to say this there are many plenty of other possibilities as well on how you can upgrade uh, even um, the microscopes I have a swift 350t coming on Tuesday my biggest worry is that uh, I won't know what I'm looking at is there a book website resource that shows the pictures of specimens with an identification this is a huge question a huge topic and it's uh, um, quite a common uh, quite a common issue um, when you're looking at a water sample, what are you looking at, right? Um, and I just wanted to tell you that uh, if you go online and if you Google um, something, then there are online identification sites for water life. Um, now, generally, if you look at water samples, and I just assume that this is what you're going to be looking at, and then um, you will usually um, always find the same types of 
organisms. You're going to find rotifers. You're going to find nematode worms, of course, the occasional ciliate and so on, um, algae, certain yeah, um, bacteria. And you're able to relatively easily and quickly um, say, oh, that's a rotifer, okay? Or that's, a, I don't know, an oligoheat worm. Okay, um, or a nematode worm, and so on. There are only a handful of, of these big categories there. If you want to actually now know way more about it, which specific species is it? Because there's thousands of nematode worms out there, right? Um, thousands of, 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 of ciliates and so on. Which specific species is it? Then things become very quickly very complex. And sometimes not even microscopes um, are able to help you here. Because sometimes you need to do a DNA test or biochemical analysis. Right? But in most cases, you don't need to know exactly the name of the species. And um, it could even be that some of the things that you see probably have not even been yet identified down all the way down to the species level. Right? So it is. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is, is that uh, uh, f uh, finding out what the big categories are um, is not such a big problem. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So this is basically a little bit of a staining thing. I don't know anything about stains, but they are so conceived that they show certain things depending on the stain. Can it help determine or exclude that um, unknown club type of thing in the species? Ah, I see. Okay. The question is: is uh, the question is the following? Is is uh, if you are using a stain, can you then distinguish what it is? And um, the the answer is is generally. Uh, it depends, yes. Um, methylene blue has the characteristic of uh, staining relatively unspecifically. It is a, um, an alkaline stain, so it likes to stain um, acidic parts of a cell. Yeah. Um, then there is hemotoxylin eosin stain, which is very common for staining plants. Um, so um, indeed, uh, in some cases, you can use staining to distinguish different uh, parts. But... Um, the question is really if it is really for hobby purposes at the beginning even um, always relevant yeah? because uh, um, sometimes if you want to stain it in such a way that it actually helps in identification, then it can be quite elaborate. For example, I'll give you a, a, a good example, iodine, right? Uh, you add iodine uh, to a sam sample and starch stains black, then you know it's starch, right? Yeah. Um, so this is uh, yeah, maybe the most straightforward one. And for this reason, there are different types of stains. Or for example, this methylene blue stain that I'm using, if you stain blood with that, then the nuclei of the white blood cells are going to be stained blue. So because it likes to stain DNA. So yes, indeed, um, yeah, certain parts can be identified. Yeah. So I'm playing around with uh, astronomical light filters, uh, hydrogen alpha filters, and so on. Um, yeah. Um, is this useful for something that, uh, uh, so basically the question is, is um, hydrogen alpha filters and so on, um, which is used for observing stars and so on. Generally, if you put, uh, this is a, I've long time ago, I've been doing a little bit of astronomy. Um, generally, those filters are uniform in color. And so what you do is, is if you add those filters to your microscope, then everything's just going to have the same color and you're still not going to see anything. Yeah. Um, so the idea in microscopy really is, is not just to give everything the same color, but actually to increase the color contrast. And this is the purpose of, of using stains like you have over here. This is where you actually can now see the structure which reacts with the stain and absorbs the stain um, is darker than the surrounding background. If I were to add a uniform color filter over the whole thing, then everything's just going to have the same color and then you're not able to, still not able to see anything, uh, any details. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, I'm also using a USB webcam that has no filter um, on the light sensor. So, not even the infrared uh, red filter that most camera sensors have in front of them. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I'm just checking again the, the comments section. Uh, the Lion Master is asking, how do you get all these ideas to make a live about something different every week? Honestly, uh, this is an honest question. Where do I get my ideas from? And I'm going to give you a very honest answer. This is the most difficult thing. Yeah, really. Um, sometimes uh, even, uh, I mean, I'm doing the live stream at my time Saturday evening. Sometimes uh, even Saturday morning, I don't know yet exactly what I'm going to do. 
Um, so this uh, stresses me out sometimes because uh, I'm looking then in, on, on, you know, for, for ideas. And uh, today I simply decided, uh, okay, uh, a little bit uh, by coincidence, I said, okay, I'm going to go to the supermarket and I would like to, simply because I'm interested, I would like to put some of this artificial meat, this vegan meat under the microscope um, to because I just wanted to know myself, right? Um, and uh, um, I have to admit, it's not the most exciting specimen, really. I mean, just look at this. Yeah, you know what you're seeing here, right? Uh, it, it's not the most exciting specimen. Yeah, it doesn't look uh, particularly interesting or great, but still, um, just by looking at it, um, yeah, sometimes I feel it's it's still interesting because it's the stuff that I'm eating, right? Um, and occasionally, um, and this was a little bit the idea today is I, I try to find parts that I can identify with fat droplets, xylem tissues, the occasional worm, <laughs> some some dust fibers maybe. Yeah, um, so that's a little bit the thing here. But I do admit that uh, that uh, coming up with topics is is not easy. Okay. Yeah, um, and uh, for me, this is also something that I have to say is is that uh, sometimes I do not really prepare a lot for those live streams um, it's because I just want to see it myself right um, the, the first time myself right um so this uh, means that uh, as i mentioned at the beginning some of sometimes these uh the things that i'm showing you are kind of highly improvised yeah and uh, by the way i'm i'm currently working on another uh video of uh, this artificial meat because in this one sample i've got i found a lot of fibers um, and uh actually yeah, I cleaned my microscope slide and I was kind of wondering where do all of those fibers come from? It looks like, like I don't know, microplastics or something, <laughs> which is not a surprise because if these are soybeans, I mean, like, for example, over here, yeah, if these are soybeans, are made of soybeans, I mean, uh, and those fibers are found in, 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 in even in rainwater, yeah, then <laughs> the thing that surprises me a little bit is, is that they're not shredded, you know, because everything's shredded and then... And, and, made into small particles but sometimes those fibers are able to persist yeah you could try to make uh, for the community easier to give you suggestions and it may help you yes uh, i'm always uh, um, yeah uh, thankful for suggestions and if you that's why i would like to encourage you if you have any um, uh, um any pictures that you would like to share for example um, or even short video clips uh, if you want to share your microscopy setup with the community as well please send some short videos uh, uh, or or pictures um, even and i would like to at the beginning of each uh, live stream to 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 share them okay um yeah so uh, Toluridin blue for plant tissues, okay. The oil drops are pretty and the mystery object still needs to be found, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, it makes you realize that our body does not, in quotation marks, care what the food looks like. It just needs nutrients no matter what it looks like in the microscopic scale. That's correct, because when we chew it, it's, and then when it's digested, it's uh, broken up into pieces anyway. Yeah. Yeah, exact again here for example uh, found lots of these fibers yeah in there yeah. so here here again um i actually um have done the following i actually cleaned my microscope slides as well because i was kind of concerned that uh, maybe some of those fibers are might be simply from um already on the microscope slide but uh, even after cleaning i was able to find them yeah yeah so, people, what time is it? It's already uh, yeah, one hour and 12 minutes I've been talking. Um, I'm slowly starting to feel that it might be time to go to bed, at least. <laughs> it might be a different, uh, you might be in a completely different time zone. Okay. And uh, do you always random scan your slides or do you have a more uh, methodic approach? Well, uh -huh. right now I'm just more or less randomly scanning it. But when I um, am looking for face mites, for example, and I made it just a few days ago a video, I'm just, yeah, I always do the following. Um, I start on, on, yeah, um, on, on one side, yeah, and I go down, okay, I go down much slower of course yeah then i go across yeah and i go up again yeah first at a lower magnification and then at a higher one yeah so right now i'm just going around a little bit randomly because uh yeah 
There is, I'm not looking for anything specific. Yeah. And uh, usually um, you have to do a very systematic scan of the slides if the object, objects that you're looking for are not very common. Yeah? But if you just want to get a general overview of what's there, then you just basically, yeah, there's no, no need. Yeah, again here, occasionally when you zoom in, this, uh, yeah, again, no cellular structure could be some kind of a simply coagulated protein. Those bubbles over here might not be bubbles, but again, some fat droplets, yeah. How hard is it to find tardigrades? Um, again, here the answer is, is you have to look for tardigrades at the right place. Um, I've ha had some samples, um, moss samples, where there were none to be found. And I had moss samples where there were so many of them that you couldn't believe it. Um, and generally what I recommend, if you want to find tardigrades, get yourself a moss sample. Um, which is not or which was not directly exposed to the heat um, of the sunlight. So, for example, if you go into the forest where there's always some kind of shade and humidity, I found moss samples there to contain many more tardigrades than, for example, exposed moss, which is growing somewhere on a rock where the sun is able to shine um, on, and dry out the moss. Right, um, And then what you do is, is you rinse the moss a little bit in water and you allow everything to settle and this, so you look at some of the sediment and then generally you're going to be lucky. If you do not find tardigrades right away and if you keep on looking for tardigrades and if you cannot find a lot of them, then change. you're probably better off changing the moss sample than simply trying to continue to look for tardigrades because it might not be an ideal sample. So this is, yeah... Um, but you know what's probably even easier to find than tardigrades? <laughs> I just recently made a video. This is actually the face mites in your eyelashes. Yeah, um, it's, uh, yeah I've been sometimes more successful in finding those. Is euglena the closest thing to combine plant or animal or is there another interesting one to look at? It is fascinating to go back to the splitting of those king these kingdoms. Euglena is a protist, a protozoan and and historically, scientists have been debating, is it an animal uh, because it's able to feed on food or is it a plant because it's able to do photosynthesis? It's neither. Yeah, it is uh, um, essentially its own, yeah, yeah, its own kingdom, so to say, its own category. Um, belongs to the protozoans, to the protists. Yeah, and the thing why there are some a little bit of biology you now. The reason why there is sometimes some these classification problems is because you can, strictly speaking, not simply look at one criterion alone to classify organisms. Like, how does it feed? Right? It's generally not enough. There are also photosynthetic bacteria. They do photosynthesis, and they are completely not related to the plants at all, right? But they still do photosynthesis, right? So you see, um, that is a, a a problem that scientists in the past have been kind of uh, fighting a little bit. Is is, is this grouping and classification? Um, but um, in reality, sometimes you're dealing with a completely separate category. Yeah. If you have managed to remove a face mite from the adhesive film with oil, there is a way to keep it as a preparation. Um, uh, for a while in Upro, um basically you want to make it. Um, oh, that's difficult. You probably want to make a, a permanent, uh, permanently mounted slide. Um, I'm a little bit concerned because about that because in order to make a permanently mounted slide, you have to remove the water from uh, from uh, the, uh, fr from the organism, and if the face mite is in oil, I mean it's a, it's alive, so it still contains water, right? Um, you have to somehow remove the oil first, probably with alcohol, and uh, I can imagine that uh, any form of dehydration or removal of water might cause a deformation of the face mite. Um, because they are kind of soft, you know, and usually this causes a, quite a bit of shrinkage. I have not tried this yet, uh, but but actually that might be something to experiment around with. But I have also have to tell you, I have I tried to remove the uh, the, the the oil of uh, the face mite in the droplet also with a little bit of, of liquid dishwash soap, which I had some struggling had to struggle with that a little bit. It was not so easy because it's so small. Um, so it I have not tried it yet. Um, uh, but essentially, I take it uh, the suggestion to make a yeah, permanently mounted slide of a face mite. That would be interesting. Yeah? That would be kind of interesting. Thank you for the suggestion. 
yeah so people you know what um, I'm going to do now is, is I think I'm going to call it quits uh, for the day I think uh, yeah um, I think maybe indeed I'm going to try this uh, to try different mounting media but maybe what I would like to try as well and no guarantee that I'm going to be successful it's springtime here right now and in, in, yeah in the northern hemisphere I would like to um, put it, do a little bit again of pollen microscopy and then maybe I'm able to manage to get some pollen tubes to grow um, I have to fine-tune a little bit the sugar concentration um, so maybe I'm going to be lucky with that no guarantee but that's a little bit uh, the project that I would like to work on yeah so enough for today thank you again for having uh, joined in um, if you have any suggestions about anything that you want me to put under the microscope please uh, do leave your comments behind if you have any pictures that you want me to share with the community um, write uh, an email to oliver at microbehunter.com and uh, yeah i wish you around uh, we wish you all the best and uh, hope to see you around uh, next uh, next week again bye bye all the best and have a nice day